name's Dale Partridge, the founder of Sevenly. Uh, blogger, author, kind of speaker. This is my gig this last couple you know, months to years now. Uh, I'm going to talk to you guys about people over profit. Uh, see if I can get my... This is me. Uh, that's me, probably 1990. I'm, uh, I'm 29 years old and was born in 1985. My life really consisted of growing up right outside of L.A. in Southern California. I had a brother. You know, we, we had a pretty typical family. And my dad worked at General Electric, and he would come home uh, at, say, 3.30 in the afternoon. He would he'd park his truck in the driveway, and he'd walk in, and he'd set his keys down on this like, little like, side table that was by our entrance. And he'd look me in the eye, and he'd say, Dale, today I'm wearing the golden handcuffs. And at that time, I had no idea what the heck he's talking about. I'm five, right? So uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, as I get older, he keeps saying this statement to me, and I realize that he's saying is that I have a job that's too good to leave. Okay, now many of you guys have maybe experienced this or have, have parents who have had the same story. They wake up and they go to a career that they hate. There's broken promises. They've had this experience with capitalism, right? And, you know, my dad continued to grow up, you know, as I was growing up, say, hey, Dale, let's go, uh, let's go get cans in the morning. Not because we needed the money, but my dad wanted to teach me that I could make money on my own. And as I got a little bit older, he'd say, hey, Dale, I think I'm going to bring home boxes uh, from work for you to sell his moving boxes, right? So he'd bring home these boxes in his truck, and, you know, I'd sell three for a small one, five for a medium one, and, and seven for a big one. This is like in the recycler. It's like pre-Craigslist, pre-internet. And um, I was making like 700 bucks a month as like a seven-year-old. It's crazy. And, uh, you know, my dad was obviously helping me do the copywriting and these ads and stuff, right? Um, and as I get older, I go into junior high, and I start selling Airhead Taffy. I'd go to, like, Price Club, right, pre-Costco, and... Um, I'd pick up these Airhead Taffies and I'd sell them, you know, 25 cents to the kids I liked and 75 cents to the kids I didn't like. <laughs> and I was making great money. And I look back, I realize that, that that statement that my dad was making was more than a statement. It was an invitation. It was an invitation to be an entrepreneur. It was an invitation to pave my own way. He never called me an entrepreneur. He never asked me to be an entrepreneur. He was grooming me to be an entrepreneur. My dad was never an entrepreneur. You know, he worked at General Electric for 30 years. And by the time I was 25, I'd created over five companies producing over $5 million a year. Um, I had sold companies in my teens. And I realized that I was on this search and success wasn't fixing me. And I was trying to figure out how can I blend purpose and profit together? How could I take capitalism and flip it upside down? What would that look like? And it ended in three simple words. People over profit. You know, see, and I wanted to figure out how do I actually take this concept and put it into practice? What would that look like? I don't want to just talk about it and say, oh, my God, here, check out my, my GoDaddy account with, like, the, the graveyard of all my ideas, right? Yeah. And I wanted to, to make it real. So... I started a company called Sevenly. Uh, raise your hand if you guys have heard of Sevenly. Um, a lot of you guys. This is great. Um, Sevenly, we, you know, every week we partner with a new nonprofit. We give $7 for every item sold to a charity. In the last few years, we've raised almost $4 million in $7 donations. It's been an incredible ride, uh, but it's not the drive. Behind me is, is this kind of concept that I'm going to talk to you here in a second. My job as the CEO was to cast vision, was to lead people, and to monitor markets. I got super fascinated with monitoring markets. I was wondering, why the heck is it working? Like, why is my business in business, and why is it growing faster than most other companies? We went from zero to about 50 employees in about two years. And I wanted to know, is this a bubble? Is this going to, like, fall apart? Why were companies like Tom's Shoes and, and Warby Parker and Crochet Kids and Giving Keys and some of these other companies that I, I'm surrounded with that are trailblazing the marketplace? There's a shift. There was really a shift towards good. This was happening. But was consumers just wanting to be more generous or thoughtful or responsible? Or were companies just wanting to be nicer? Like, what was really behind this? Was this a trend? Um, so before we, we go into this, I want to show you guys a couple examples of some industries, while we have this kind of boom that's going on, the shift towards good, there's still quite a few companies and industries that are still struggling. So this is my doctor's office. Okay, so that's literally my doctor's office. It's a horrible photo because it's an ugly room. Um, 
And this, uh, you know, you guys maybe have a doctor's office like this. And, you know, the moment you walk in, you don't really care, feel cared for, right? You feel antiquated. You know, you, you sit down and you, you, you come up to the desk and you sign your name in with this a classic pharmaceutical company pen and this dirty sign-in sheet. And uh, you're thinking, why the heck don't we have freaking iPads yet here, you know? And um, you look at all the files behind the countertop and you're like, this is ridiculous. And, you know, you're surrounded by tacky wallpaper, germ-covered magazines from 2009, you know, this, this, these, like, stained chairs that have been cleaned for a few years. You sit down, and you're like, okay, I'm going to wait for the doctor. I'm on time. And, you know, you start seeing patients, like, in and out every seven minutes, right? I think back to the statistic of, you know, the average doctor visit in 1965 was about 37 minutes, okay? Now we're down to seven. I mean, you can't even change your oil for seven minutes, right? So this is, you know, you're in and out. You're, we're prescribing. We're not healing, and this experience, I'm sitting there thinking, man, like, this is, this is a time where people are valuing profit more than they're valuing the patients that they vowed to care for. Like, th there's this experience where doctors who are making, you know, $400,000 or more a year, depending on the practice, can't see the value in updating their stinking waiting rooms. Like, why? What's going on here? Food companies have increased efficiency at the cost of quality to create a product that they wouldn't even feed to their own families. Executives have chosen a level of greed and immorality that's just affected thousands of customers and employees that they said they were going to care for. Cell phone companies have forced two-year contracts on their customers rather than just creating a service that people would stand behind on their own. Okay? See, but out of this same trend here, this downward trend in capitalism is an upward trend. I call it the bright counterpart. It's arising from this trend in capitalism, right? A counterpart that says, we'll pay more to be honest and have integrity. We're contract free. We're healthy. We're organic. And we don't just care about our customers. We care about our world. Now, many of you guys have called this counterpart conscious capitalism. Maybe you guys have called it social good or philanthropic capitalism. But my question for you is, is conscious capitalism a generational phenomenon or is it a time-tested pattern? A piece, you know, of a bigger picture, movement of eras that's rotating through time over and over again. Let's talk more about movement. See, movement, I think people are intrinsically attracted to movement. Something moves, is it food or is it threat? Is it good or is it bad? Where is it going? What does it teach me? What does it tell me? See, but movement can also be from anything of, you know, the economy, trends, even morals. But what's even greater than movement is pattern of movement. See, pattern removes uncertainty. Pattern offers us the, you know, the insights and the ability to plan. And ultimately, pattern is what gives us the ability to trust. And you see companies use pattern all the time. So like Airbnb saw that there's a pattern of people that would rather stay in a home than a hotel. They built their whole company around it. Okay, Netflix. There's a pattern of people that said, I would rather not go to Blockbuster and get a movie, right? Um, and they built their entire business around it. I've discovered a pattern in capitalism that's been happening over the last 160 years, repeating itself. Um, it's going to show us exactly where we were, where we are, and where we're going. But first, I want to do a little exercise with you guys. I want you guys to raise your hands. I'm going to show you seven company logos. And I want you to raise your hand if you believe these companies value people over profit. And I want you to raise your fist if you believe these, these companies value profit over people. Okay? You ready? We're going to be a little quick here. Starbucks. Okay? Chick-fil-A. It's like we are in Atlanta, right? <laughs> um, Bank of America. <laughs> Apple. It's like pre-Steve Jobs, Tim Cook, I don't know. <laughs> McDonald's. Ford. Whole Foods. See, the interesting thing is that many of you guys would have changed your answers pending on one thing. The year that I asked that question. Okay. Has Bank of America always been perceived to value profit over people? No. 
they were a great startup in like the 1890s, right? <laughs> um, they have a great story. I mean, if I had time to tell their whole story, you'd be like, wow, what a great company. How did they transition from there to where they are now? What happened over time? What cycle did they go through? Companies and organizations function in four distinct eras of time. I'm going to show you where many companies have started, where they are, and possibly where they're going. Now, I could use the medical industry or the financial industry. I'm going to use the automotive industry and the company Ford because everybody probably has a car in here and everybody knows who Ford is, so it's an easy example. So, take out your notes. This is probably the, the note-worthy spot of the, of the conversation. We're going to move into the first era. This is the honest, exceptional, and moral era. This is people over profit, and all companies start here. This is when companies are captivated by their values, when craftsmanship, quality, authenticity, integrity are all at the core of the company. This is Ford, 1914, when they became the first company in the world to offer a 40-hour work week. Okay, in, the, in the face of their competitors offering an 80 to 100-hour work week, Ford said, no, that's not right. No one should be able to work that much. So we're going to work with the unions, we're going to offer some benefits, and we're going to have you guys work five days a week for eight hours a day. This is revolutionary, right? But as companies grow, they start making subtle exceptions and deviations to make room for their growth, which pushes them into the next era, which is the efficient, satisfactory, and ethical era. This is people and profit. This is typically companies operating in their prime. Okay, this is when companies start to become addicted to more and they start confusing being bigger with being better. Now, this is outsourcing, you know, bulk manufacturing, speed, mass production, moves to the core of the company. This is Ford, 1955, when they became, you know, one of the leading manufacturers of automobiles in the country. The rollout of the Mustang, the Cobra, the Shelby. See, but... As you see, companies, once they get to this point, they become addicted to more. They might go public. You know, profitability, cash flow, these things are at the core of why they started. Their, their history, their values are becoming to become a footnote in their history just once when they started, which sends them down the line of ethics and morals just a little bit lower to the deceptive, unacceptable, and unethical era. This is profit over people. This is when companies are typically destroyed by greed. This is planned obsolescence, shortcuts, layoffs, disproportionate wealth moves to the core of the company. This is Ford, 1971, with the rollout of the Ford Pinto. Did anybody drive a Ford Pinto in here? Yeah? This guy. Let's, let's be happy that he's here and that he didn't die in this car, okay? 900 people died in that car, many of them from burning alive. Now, do you guys remember, just to put some perspectives, do you guys remember the Toyota thing in 2010, the accelerator issue? 89 people died there. It was on the front page of the New York Times. It was on Time Magazine. You know, it was on CNN. It made even a skit on Saturday Night Live. It was huge, right? And it was a massive, massive mistake. This is 10 times this. 1971, 900 people died, many of which burned alive. Ford released a statement a few years later that said, we knew about the design flaw. Uh, we thought it was cheaper to pay for the lawsuits than to fix the car. How does that happen, right? Would Henry Ford 1914 version of himself say that? Would they have been able to stay in business if that happened in 1914? No. Something has happened. Something has changed in the company. It has gone through some eras. It's interesting, this is also the beginning of the economy shifting trend of nobody wanting to buy an American made car. And this is also a time when enough companies, in my research at least, when enough companies have hit the deceptive era at the same time, it's triggered a recession. 1898, 1929, 1971, 2008. There's a trend that's occurring here. See, but as, as, as we've learned is that customers won't stand for this for long. Companies must right their wrongs, recognize their failures, or go out of business, which sends them into the next era. This is the apologetic, 
rectifying and highlighting of truth era. This is where most companies are at now, post-2008 recession, trying to repair their brand with consumers that are highly skeptical and have, high, or have really low consumer trust. This is when companies are making a revolutionary act. It's the resurrection of their core values that once started their company. It's when transparency, the exposing of lies, and the redomestication of product come back into the core of the company. This is Ford in 2009. When they uh, said, hey, we're not going to take the bailout money. We want to do this on our own. They rolled out 10-year, 100,000-mile warranties that have never been done before. Car companies like Hyundai said, hey, if you bought a car from us and you lose your job, just return the car. It's like, whoa, this is a whole other side of the automobile industry we've never seen before. See, the interesting thing is that we're not going to get worse, but better. We're actually going to follow these, these companies from the apologetic era back into the honest era to be companies that are ultimately living a great story. And I think it's going to be around 2000 or 2020. See, but many of you guys are skeptics, right? Like, who's this guy? This guy's 29 years old. What the heck does he know about capitalism? He's born in the 80s. Um, so... Skeptics need examples to believe. So I'm going to give you a few examples that we are indeed kind of, we're, we're pretty much operated in an apologetic era of time. Documentaries. Raise your hand if you've watched a documentary in the last 60 days. Almost everybody. Okay. There's been more documentaries in the past five years than there has been in the past 50 years, yet we've had the same technology. People are searching for truth. People are exposing lies, and people are looking for change. Farmer's markets. Raise your hand if you've been to a farmer market in the last, you know, couple months. So we have such a distrust for our food right now. Like, we don't know what the heck all natural means. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we even don't know if organic is really organic. Does it have the USDA logo on it? Um, we said, screw this. We're not going to just, we don't trust our food companies. We don't trust our, you know, food distributors. We're going to go straight to the farm. You just ask the dude, hey, man, where'd you grow this, you know? Um, <laughs> true story films. We're kind of searching for this truth. We want to know. We don't want to be lied to anymore. We've, had this, we've been burned for the last many years. And, and this true story film has been a 400% increase in the last 10 years. It's this interesting phenomenon. You get movies like 12 Years of Slave or, or, or Dallas Buyers Club or, or Captain Phillips, some of these great movies that have been coming out. We want these true stories. We're yearning for them. Um, Made in America and Fair Trade. People are looking and are willing to pay more for products that they know were made legally and ethically. Craft beer, coffee, and food. Raise your hand if you had craft beer in the last 24 hours. There we go. <laughs> so um, we want to have a story behind the brand. We want to know who made it. That's really important to us now. And it's funny, you can start seeing, like, which goes into the next vintage area, is that like you see like Miller Lite bringing back their vintage can. You see like all the baseball teams bringing back their vintage uniforms. We got like you know, like pallet boards on our ceilings now, and we want to feel like we live in a barn. And, you know, it's, it's, we got vintage filters for our, for our, you know, Instagram photos. You know, we've, we got rid of like all the crazy Photoshop work. Now it's all natural light photography. Folk music is on a huge boom. Homeschooling's coming back. All these examples are here, okay? We're searching, we, we are homesick for an era of time, uh, an era of capitalism that we trust. We're trying to recreate it. We, we like vintage because it's an era that we trust more than the one that we're living in now. So there's three things I want you guys to walk away with. Number one, conscious capitalism is not a trend. It's a reaction. It's a reaction to an era of deception. And our goal is to figure out how do we keep it there without going through that cycle. I don't have enough time today to do that talk. But there are companies that have done it, that are doing it, and there is a way. That'll be in my book. Number two, we are currently living in the apologetic era. Okay? This is a time where many companies are, again, struggling post-2008 recession, trying to renew their brand. And transparency, authenticity, integrity are your organization's best strategies right now. Number three. This is a huge opportunity for marketers and leaders, huge, to be those who can ultimately lead us from the apologetic era back into the honest era and stay there, to always be honest, moral, and exceptional. And I want to give you guys an invitation. 
kind of the, the same invitation that my dad gave me 20 years ago. An invitation to a good way. An invitation to an exciting way. And an invitation to the best way. An invitation to value people over profit. Thank you.